Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Adol Korkort, and I'm the uh, founder and the CEO of, of the AV Corporate Foundation. Uh, this is today is the, the fourth in the series of webinars that we have put together uh, that deals with strategies for physical and emotional wellness during the COVID-19 pandemic and hopefully beyond. They, there, there was uh, uh, tremendously helpful information that we have learned from Dr. Bartholomew about exercise and mental health, uh, from Dr. Lerman, who discussed uh, depression, anxiety, and domestic violence, uh, from Dr. Moser uh, on Monday, who discussed with us uh, the uh, uh, suicide issues. But today, we are so delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Nick Wignell, who is a clinical psychologist and writer at the Cognitive Behavioral Institution in Albuquerque to discuss with us a very important topic uh, uh, titled Resilience Training and Mindfulness in, everybody, in, in, in Everyday Life. To keep in mind that, you know, we at the A.V. Corker Foundation believe that uh, mental health is in physical health and is in the entire well-being of the individuals, including that of the state of their mind. We all know that, that uh, uh, we can't choose the situations that we're in, but we can choose how we react to them. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to listening to Dr. Wignall's discussion, who is going to help us be armed with the, what we need to do to be able to address those challenges that we end up facing and, and having to react to. So, Dr. Wignall, thank you so much for, for joining us, and uh, I look forward, and we all look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate the introduction, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, let me pull up my slides real quick. Okay. All right. So. As we mentioned, we're going to be talking about resilience um, and resilience training, but specifically in everyday life. And, and that's really what I, I want the emphasis on this, this presentation to be, this is practical exercises for resilience in everyday life. Um, so I think, you know, resilience is kind of a big term. It's, it's a little vague to some degree, but I want to get really practical and specific with how this can be helpful. Um, in a doable way in everybody's life in, in regular circumstances. So that, that's kind of the introduction. Um, so before we get started, I, before we even dive into what resilience itself is, I, I wanna make a really important distinction. Um, and I wanna set resilience apart from coping. When you hear the term coping, coping is what you're forced to do when you haven't trained for resilience. Okay, so the, there's nothing, um, the, the point of training for resilience is so that you shouldn't, hopefully you won't even need coping or coping skills in the moment. You will have built up sort of strength and resilience in, in practice and training so that when you get to the game time situation, you can, you can simply act on your best instincts and what's most important to you and what's most helpful. Um, so I think that's really important that you, we don't, coping is necessary sometimes. We all face unexpected um, stressors and we, we have to sort of try and do things in the moment to, to cope and pull out strategies. But I think ideally the, the most important, the, the better way to think about how do I deal with difficult things that come up in my life is, can I, can I train myself ahead of time to be prepared to deal with difficulties generally? It's, it's essentially the idea of prevention is the best medicine, right? We all need medical interventions, but if at all possible, it's best to you know, improve sort of lifestyle factors, diet, exercise, um, all those sorts of things so that when we are hit with illness, um, we, we're able to rebound and recover faster. So that's sort of the idea. I, I like to think of um, athletes when I think of resilience. So every athlete knows you're going to be faced sometimes with very challenging situations. You know, Michael Jordan, you know, down by one point, uh, games on the line, he gets the ball, all this, think of all the stress. When he's in that moment under all that stress and pressure, he, he doesn't have time to stop and pull out a coping card and think like, hmm, how do I handle all this stress? What? I, no, he's been training his whole life so that he can simply act when he's in that moment of stress and pressure and do the thing that he needs to do. So that's sort of the metaphor. Um, when, I, when I think of resilience, that's, I, I want to apply that to mental health and emotional well-being, okay? So, but it's important to, to really distinguish 
Resilience is the training you do so that when stressors happen, um, you're able to respond effectively. Whereas coping is what you do when you you haven't been training and you don't you you don't have any prior experience that helps guide you. Um, so th the next thing to kind of ask is, well, what's the source of resilience? Where does resilience come from? Um, how do we you know how do we build it? We're going to talk a lot about that. But the, the idea I want to impress upon you right off the bat is that you know people tend to think of there's been a couple of major models that have dominated mental health and well-being um, over the years, over the centuries, really. And for a long time, up until maybe the late 1900s, early 20th century, we were sort of dominated by the choice model or the moral model, which meant that how we, you know, our, our mental health, how we experience emotions was a function of our, our character, our morality, essentially. And we, we you know, in the 20th century, we, we, we kind of left that behind to some degree. And we replaced it with a much more medical model of emotional well-being and health. Um, that you know, you're, if you're depressed, it's because you have low serotonin in your brain, or um, it, it's it, it it in its worst form, it became overly deterministic um, and sort of reductive. And then in the last twenty years or so, we've moved to this what I think of as the skill model of mental health. We think of you know, you always hear about um, coping skills and strategies for dealing with um, with stress or with depression or with anxiety. And you kind of something happens and you pull out your strategy and you, you remember to do it. And and I think all these models have have flaws because very few of them are truly integrated and, and sort of reflect the full sense of what it means to be human, which is we do have choice and sort of moral uh, we have autonomy in how we what we decide to do and the decisions we make to some degree um, we are also somewhat determined by our bodies and our chemistry um, and we can make use of specific skills but i, I want to suggest that a, a better more integrative model for how to think about mental health is habits and specifically habits are the are the type of thing that they integrate all three of those things your your choices you know how you how you make decisions and, and decide to do things your um your physiology you know your body and then also your sort of strategies and your skills and so the idea with resilience is that almost always when, when we get hit with a stressor when times are tough we tend to sink to the level of our habits right so um a a, a specific example of this might be you know when you are giving a talk, public speaking, you know, it's, you know, every, every person's number one fear. People are more afraid of public speaking than, than death, right? Um, you, you could have a, a set of like coping cards that tell you, okay, if I get stressed, I should do this, or here's the order of, you know, slides that I want to go through or, and those things are, those are fine, but really good presenters, the way they deal with the stress of being um, on stage is they train, they practice, they prepare ahead of time, often quite a bit. So that when they get onto the stage and they're they're faced with that inevitable stress of you know thousands of people watching them, they they can almost operate on instinct according to their habits that they've trained. And so to me, that's really the the model for thinking about resilience and and, and really health generally in our mental health is how can we how can we build healthy habits on a regular, consistent basis such that we we are prepared and strong when we are hit with the inevitable kind of pains and stressors of life. Um, so I think this idea of habits is, is really, really important. And, and that's really the kind of the heart of resilience training. It means it's not about learning coping skills necessarily. It's about training healthy habits that assist you when things are stressful. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through three of these, I think, three ways to train for emotional resilience. And they're essentially habits that you can build in everyday life. Um, and the first one is what I call emotional curiosity. Um, now, and th these are these habits are based on, you know, my sort of reading and research in, in the topic of resilience, which is huge. I mean, it's just an enormous, um, there's a lot of literature on it. But then also my clinical experience work with I work with clients every single day. I'm a therapist. Um, and so a lot of these come out of my understanding of um, the science and the literature, but then also what actually works with people in regular life. And, and so th this this first one, emotional curiosity. Um, 
what you tend to see with people who are not resilient, who when, when stressors happen, when times are tough, they get kind of laid flat. They just really get knocked over or they, and they, they have a hard time recovering. One of the things you notice if you pay attention is they're very combative with their own emotions. So something happens, you know, there you've been in, in quarantine all day with your, with your spouse and your three kids and everyone's getting on each other's nerves and your, your spouse asks you to do something, but you know, her tone of voice is just so that it kind of irritates you. Right. And then you fly off the handle, right. You just kind of lose it completely, which obviously is not ideal. When you really slow down and zoom in on these situations, what you often find is when people ratchet up to extreme levels of emotionality, what you find right before that is they they have a they kind of pass judgment on themselves for how they feel. So they'll they'll be these very quick thoughts that rush through their head, things like, "Oh God, like I can't, I can't believe I'm getting frustrated again. Why am I always so frustrated? Why do I have to be frustrated? And why do we have to be quarantined like this?" And that judgment of how they're feeling, what, what they don't see is that magnifies the emotional response later. So in addition to feeling frustrated, you're also feeling guilty or ashamed about yourself for feeling frustrated. And this is, this is just absolutely fundamental to why people have a hard time being resilient in emotionally difficult situations. And on the other hand, how people who are resilient how they manage it. Like this is just one of those secrets that's very hard to see, but once you see it, it's, it's, it's hard to unsee. And so this idea of emotional curiosity, I like the, the concept of curiosity because this is the starting point for changing your relationship with your own emotions, okay? If you have a combative kind of judgmental approach to when you feel bad emotionally, you're, you're just gonna ratchet up your overall level of emotional intensity and which will most likely lead to unhelpful or regrettable behaviors. On the other hand, if you can have, if you can approach even difficult emotions, like you would approach a friend who's struggling with something difficult in kind of an, an open, curious, empathetic way, you can really do a lot to diffuse the intensity of those emotions you're experiencing and which will help you act more in alignment with, um, with your values and, and what's important to you. Um, so fostering, and I like this idea of curiosity because it's, it's pretty ordinary. Anyone kind of understands what curiosity means. Um, but if we can learn to be a little bit more curious of how we're feeling in the moment, instead of judgmental or combative about it, um, we, can, we can often, um, it can have pretty dramatic impacts on how we end up behaving and what we end up doing. So there's one specific habit that I think helps build this, this idea of emotional curiosity, this habit of emotional curiosity, and that is mindfulness meditation. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably rolling your eyes. Like everybody talks about mindfulness. I roll my eyes every time people talk about mindfulness because it's, it's such a trendy topic these days, just in our culture. Everybody's talking about mindfulness and everybody's pitching mindfulness as a cure for everything, it seems like, under the sun. Um, but I, when I use mindfulness and when I work with my clients um, on mindfulness, I use it in a very technical, specific sense. Um, and that is mindfulness meditation is, it's a, it's a way to practice training your attention. It's a way to practice training your attention. And I'm, I'm going to get into what that means, but we have to get over a, a very common misconception about mindfulness right off the bat, which is a lot of people think of mindfulness as a way to calm down, that it's, a, it's sort of a relaxing strategy, it's a relaxation strategy. They're like, well, I'm so stressed, I'm gonna do some mindfulness and then I will feel more relaxed afterwards. And inevitably, you might feel a little bit more relaxed, but anyone who's tried to start a serious meditation practice, you know how frustrating and how hard it is, how difficult it is. And so what I, what I wanna just validate is doing mindfulness, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, but it, it is a practice, it's an exercise, okay? So it, to some extent, it should be hard. It, it's, like, it's like a workout, it should be effortful and even frustrating sometimes. That doesn't mean it's not working. In fact, that means it is working to a large extent because what you're doing in, in most forms of mindfulness is you're training your attentional muscle to, so for instance, a common form of mindfulness is you focus on your breath. You know, you kind of keep your emotion, your, um, your attention, your focus on how it feels to breathe. 
And of course, inevitably, you end up getting distracted, you know, some thought about what you need to get to the grocery store or some mistake you made at work um, earlier before comes up. And the task in mindfulness is to notice that thought and the emotion associated with it. Oh my God, like I feel uh, sadness. I feel shame because I made this mistake earlier today. Can you notice that emotion and go, oh, interesting. And then return your attention back to your breath or whatever the target of your, your meditation practice is. The mindfulness is so powerful because it, it trains your attention to be able to observe your difficult emotions and thoughts without reacting to them in a combative or avoidant way. And this is such an important skill for resilience. When you feel strong emotion, if you, if you get judgmental with your own emotions or if you try and run away from them, it's only gonna magnify them. What, what a mindfulness practice teaches you to do is, it teaches you to be able to observe and be with your emotions. And in essence, it teaches you to foster a real healthy relationship with your difficult emotions instead of treating them like an enemy. And like any relationship in our lives, you're not gonna build a relationship with someone unless you spend time with them, right? Unless you get to know them. Um, even, and you even have to kind of get past things about them that you don't necessarily like, or you use sort of foibles or things like that. So building a mindfulness meditation habit is the best way I know to help people get curious about their own emotions. And when you're curious about your own emotions, you, you eliminate that, that second layer of negative feeling when you're, you're frustrated, but then instead of getting down on yourself for feeling frustrated or getting anxious about the fact that you're frustrated, you, you chop off that second layer and you'll be shocked at how much more resilient and strong you feel when you don't have that added layer of negative emotionality. Um, so th there's a lot of resources on, on starting a mindfulness practice. I love this little book here on the slide. It's called Sit Like a Buddha, um, A Pocket Guide to Meditation. It's, it's very brief. It's like, I don't know, 50 pages or something. It's very accessible. It's very straightforward and plain. It's not mystical. And um, so it's a great little guide. I give it out to almost all my clients and to, to a lot of friends and family. It's a good guide to kind of get started with um, with the practice of mindfulness, um, which will really help foster that curious, open relationship with your own difficult emotions and thoughts, as opposed to a kind of combative one. Um, so that's the first kind of habit that I really recommend. Okay, the second one is what I call cultivated purpose. Um, sorry about these the little planets on the top, they were supposed to kind of pop in um, over time, but they're all there and that's okay, I'll explain what those mean in a second. So the big idea with this, and we know from, from just a, I mean, we know from personal experience, but we also know from a lot of the research that one of the common characteristics of very resilient people is they have a strong sense of purpose, right? So something happens and knocks them down. And what allows them to get back up again is this, it's not, it's not that they are kind of telling themselves, well, I, I, you know, I just need to start feeling better. It's, I need to feel better because I need to do this. I need to take care of this. I have some other thing in my life that really matters something bigger than myself, okay? Now that, that sounds kind of big and lofty, um, and it is <laughs> to some extent, um, but it, what I wanna present to you today is the idea that we can all create more purpose in our lives, sometimes in relatively small ways, but still in meaningful, significant ways that will help us to be more resilient. So this idea of cultivating purpose for our lives on a regular basis is really important. As I say there, it's hard to move on if you don't know where you're going, right? So if you get knocked down, but you have no idea where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do afterwards, um, that's one of the things that actually makes it hard just to get up. Um, so I, I think I use these planets up here. You can kind of see this. There's this brain in the middle, and then there's these planets. When, when you get hit with some sort of difficult stressor in life, right? Let's say if you get a really negative um, feedback on, on something at work, right? that the pain of that negativity, it's, it exerts a kind of mental gravity on your attention, right? When it, if you've made a big mistake or you've got some, something you're worried about in the future, um, it like pulls your attention. It's hard not to think about it, right? I think we can all relate to this. So your, your mind gravitates toward it. What's so powerful about purpose is, purpose is gravity pulling you in the opposite direction. So if you struggle to, uh, if you struggle with worry a lot, right, it's a common one, and you would let you say, I keep worrying. I know it just produces more stress and anxiety. I wish I could guide my, I wish I could just let it go and think about something else. That's where purpose comes in. When you're, you know, if you're, 
you're driving home from work, right? And you're, you're thinking about this mistake you made at work and you just keep going over and over it again. A strong sense of purpose is what's gonna allow you to redirect your attention to something else that really matters and kind of pull you away from that worry um, and that anxiety. So a good way, a very simple way that anyone can do that is actually really powerful um, to start to build in more purpose in their life, a, sense, a stronger sense of purpose is the common idea of the bucket list. I mean, everyone's heard of the bucket list. It's kind of this, it's almost a cliche thing. You know, I wanna go visit the pyramids in Egypt before I die, or I wanna run a marathon or write a novel or something, you know, something like that. These are kind of typical bucket list ideas. Um, but, but bucket list also includes smaller things, you know, like, um, that, that are really valuable and purposeful for you. Like for me, I'm always working on trying, I'm trying to be more patient with my kids. I have little toddlers, three, you know, two toddlers and a, and a really young daughter. And patience is like a key thing for me. I'm always trying to, to work on that. It's, it's very hard <laughs> for me anyway. Um, the idea with a bucket list though, is that most, most people like the idea of a bucket list, but, but the strange thing is very few people actually create one. <laughs> they, maybe they have some vague ideas about, yeah, you know, I want to travel here, you know, before I get too old to travel or, you know, yeah, I want to be a better parent or something like that, but it's not concrete. It's not specific. And it's not something that they regularly check in on, right? It's just sometimes they'll be reminded of it and they'll think, oh yeah, you know, I should really do something about that. Well, a very simple, relatively easy thing all of us can do to make sure that we have a stronger sense of purpose in our lives is actually create a bucket list. And so here, here's what I recommend. Sit down sometime, um, and you can do this with pen and paper or you can do it with a phone. I kind of like the phone because our phones are always on us these days. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But so you sit down and you, you open up your notes, a notes app in your phone, and you just give yourself 20 minutes some morning, you know, get up a little early or um, before you leave the office or something at work on your lunch break maybe, and just start to kind of brainstorm. What are things that are really important to me? What, what are things I would like to do? What are things I aspire to be? Or, or to accomplish and just start writing them down. And you know, give yourself again, 15, 20 minutes um, and write down the list. Now, here's the, here's the really technical, <laughs> not complicated, but technical part that's really important, I think. You wanna review and update this list regularly, right? You, you wanna keep these values and sense of purpose like front and center in your mind. You're never gonna do that if you don't have some kind of structure for doing that. So what I recommend people do is to think of this quarterly, like just like you would track maybe your expenses or your budget, you know, on a monthly or quarterly basis, what track your values on a regular basis, your, what th the things that matter most to you in your life. Surely we can all dedicate, you know, 20 minutes every three months to kind of review and refresh ourselves of what really matters to us in our life. So try to do this quarterly, set a recurring reminder in your phone that goes up, you know, Tell, tell Siri, hey Siri, set a reminder every, you know, every uh, first, you know, every three times a year or four times a year to review my bucket list. And then as you're going through life and you, and you, you realize new things that you want to add to your bucket list, values, things you want to accomplish, things you want to achieve, add them to your list. And I, this sounds simple, but it is so important for if you want to be able to be resilient and to move on from emotional difficulties, you need a why. You need something that emotionally pulls you in the opposite direction because pain and fear are going to pull you one direction and willpower is not enough. You need values and you need purpose to help you move on from those setbacks. So that's why I think purpose um, and sort of, it's not just purpose, it's cultivated purpose. It's something you you know, everyone knows that they should be good with their diet or with their finances or, but if you really want to be good with that in a long-term way, you need a system, you need a, you need habits, you need a, a, some sort of structure. And I think the same is true for our, our values and our sense of purpose. So that's my, that's the second point there. So here's the, the third one, um, is what I call perspective taking. And I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Don't believe everything you think. Thoughts are just that thoughts. So one of the hallmarks of people who really get stuck um, and who aren't particularly resilient after emotionally difficult times is they, they're very rigid in the way they think about things. Um, and what I mean by that is, so for instance, you, you, I'm, okay, I'm giving this talk now, right? 
And let's say the talk ends. And I think afterwards, oh my God, you know, that two people asked questions and I, I couldn't even, I just totally blanked out and I didn't even have an answer. It, the, that, what a disaster. Like I should never do presentations again. So the fact that like the first thought in my mind was, oh, what a disaster because I couldn't answer two questions. Just because it's the first thought that pops into your mind doesn't mean there's anything special about it. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's all that accurate. It doesn't even mean it's all that important. It's just the first thing your mind happened to throw at you. And if you stop and think a second, you, there are probably other ways to look at what happened with the presentation. You know, you might see that like, okay, there were two questions I couldn't answer, but there were actually five people who asked questions and I answered them well, and they gave me really great feedback on those. Okay, it's a bummer I missed the two, but actually I had the five and that, that's pretty good. So again, this is one of those things I think that seems sort of obvious, but in the moment, it's very easy to get rigid and stuck in a particular line of thinking. And so what, if you wanna build resilience, a really good thing to practice is have some sort of exercise or habit that helps you be flexible and take perspe different perspectives on what happens to you, especially difficult things. And a great little habit for this is what I call the evening review. And the evening review, it's very simple. All you do is each evening, it's really best to do it every single day. Although, you know, if you, if you miss summer, you can't do it, that's fine. But it should only take you a few minutes. It's a very simple thing that almost anyone can do, no matter how busy you are. And you, just, you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, um, and you answer three questions in writing. It doesn't have to be long, you're not writing essays, you know, it's just a, a sentence or two. And you respond to these questions. And what these do is they help you, these questions train mental flexibility. They, they help you establish the habit of not just believing whatever thoughts pop into your mind, but being able to step back and take multiple perspectives on what's happening to you. So the first one is what's something I did well today? So we all have a negativity bias built into us for probably evolutionary reasons. We tend to prioritize the negative. You know, it's better to not die than to remember how well you did on a few things. You know, if you, so it's, it's just hardwired in, we are gonna tend to prioritize the negative. That doesn't mean we have to get stuck in the negative though. And if you can build this kind of muscle of reminding yourself that, oh yeah, there were, no matter how negative my day went or no matter what happened to me, there were probably some good things that happened too. Um, getting in the habit of reminding yourself of that is key. If you can practice doing that every single day, you're much more likely when something really difficult does happen for that little mental muscle to kick in and for you to be able to do it in the moment, which is a huge part of resilience. Um, now, but this is not, this is not just positive thinking, right? It's not some bad happened and I just need to, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. I'm fantastic. No, that's nonsense. <laughs> the point here is not to be unrealistically positive. The point is to be, to be flexible and actually to be realistic, to be objective about what's happening to us. So, and the next point gets at that. What's something I need to work on? We don't wanna live in denial about faults or difficult things that happened or mistakes. We wanna address them, but we wanna address it in a calm sort of rational way. And this question, the second question, what's something I need to work on? It's a simple way to um, validate the fact that yes, I made some mistakes, but to do it in a even handed manner instead of exaggerating our negatives, which is something we all tend to do, I think, for the most part. And then the third one is, what's something I'm grateful for? Not something I've done particularly well today, but something that just happened to me or something that's in my life that I really appreciate. And so these three, again, what these three questions do is they, it's essentially stretching for your mind. We all get kind of locked into these like particular patterns and ways of thinking. And that rigidity is a maybe the arguably the key ingredient in uh, people who are not resilient, or people who kind of crumble or get stuck after really difficult things happen. But if you look at people who are very resilient, what you'll often find is they're remarkably flexible in the and sort of balanced in the way they think about what happens, especially difficult things. They're able to take the proper perspective, step back, and really see things relatively um, neutrally and objectively. So this little habit of the evening review, I think is a great way to, in a small way, start to cultivate that habit and that ability in yourself so that when things do get tough, you don't get stuck in one kind of rigid, unhelpful way of thinking about, about something. 
So I want to end on this great, one of my favorite quotes. Um, John Kabat-Zinn said, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Um, and I love this quote because this kind of embodies resilience, right? Like we can't, difficult, painful things are going to happen. Pandemics are going to, I mean, who would have expected that, you know, I mean, obviously some people anticipated it, but I think most of us, this was not on our radar and we just kind of got hit with it. Like you would get hit with a wave. Um, and the idea is if you, if you get in fights with difficult things, especially difficult emotions, if you, if you're combative and, or you try and run away from difficult emotions, just like waves, it's not going to happen. You're going to get crushed. Right. Um, but what you can do is, is train yourself to navigate and ride those waves skillfully. And to me, that's the heart of resilience. It's about, instead of getting in, um, being combative and, and attacking or trying to run away from your difficult emotional responses to things, it's about cultivating a much healthier relationship with your own difficult emotions. And when you can be compassionate and curious with even the most difficult experiences, your odds of being able to move on in a, in a strong and healthy way go way up. So that's kind of my um, little pitch for practical resilience and ideas for building resilience in, in ordinary life. So I hope that was helpful and happy to answer some questions now. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, you know, in the, in the current environment of, of, of the challenges associated with all the impact of COVID-19 uh, on our social life and our work environment and our financials and all that, it, the, the hardest thing is to really try to find peace within yourself with all of that and trying to absorb all of these rather difficult scenarios that are popping in every single day uh, um, in your own personal experiences and also in the experiences that now you're sharing with with your family and other employees you know mm -hmm. what, what is it what do you what do you suggest that the you know uh, the, the best way to try to identify it and, and try to deal with it on a more of a, a practical uh, way. Uh, so I'm just going to present you with a scenario of this example. Sure. You know, you're at home. Uh, you're you're normally working from from uh, from your office, but now you're working from home, and you have your kids interfering, and and you have some responsibilities that you have to address. Suddenly, you're bombarded with all those things. How do you fragment them? How do you come up with a system of which you could just take this overload and slow it down and trying mm -hmm. to figure out and focus on what's really more important. Uh, now I'm just not just reacting. I'm, I'm, I have to really think through all those reactions. So what is the process that you have to go through to be able to, to deal with that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, but it's, it's multivariate. I think there's a lot of things that go into that, the, the ability to do that. But here are a few that that I see as the most the most common ones. The first one I would say really is that idea of purpose or values. You know, like when I'm when it's been a really long day and I'm kind of at the end of my rope and my kids are just going crazy and have way too much energy and you know I'm feel like I'm getting pulled in all sorts of different directions. My instinct is going to be to you know raise my voice or yell or just kind of you know slam the door and go to another room or something like that. But if I if I'm in the habit of keeping that value of being, I want to be, I want to be a, I want to be a good parent. I want I want to be loving and compassionate with my kids. I want to have good boundaries, of course. Um, but I want to be patient. And I know kids are kids. Like this, that's their job to be energetic and rambunctious, and um, that's what they're supposed to do. And so having that really keeping your values front and center. I think this is a core really a core principle of, of mental health and well-being, certainly of resilience, is often trying to eliminate the negatives is less helpful than trying to amplify the positives. So when you're stressed, when you're feeling all that stress, you, there's nothing you can do that's just going to instantly make all that go away. You know, you could be the Dalai Lama and you're not going to be able to just instantly remove all that stress and frustration. You, you can't turn the volume all the way down on, on stress and difficulty. What you can do though sometimes is turn the volume up on a competing source. And, and I think values and purpose is a really important way to do that. That's why I love the bucket list exercise because if you can have that stuff front and center on your mind, it, 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 it just helps a lot to be able to choose that path instead of that 
instinctual um, kind of gut reaction path. The, the other thing I, I would say that's really important is I'm, I'm not, this is going to sound heretical, but <laughs> as a mental health professional, I'm not a big fan of stress reduction. People talk about stress reduction. There's all these techniques for stress reduction, you know, deep breathing and mindfulness is often pitched as a, a form of stress reduction. And sort of like coping skills, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with them, but I think that it, it often prevents us from thinking about a, in some ways, more important strategy, which is stressor reduction, stressor management. So a stressor is the thing that leads to a stress response, right? So if you're trying to work and your, your kids keep bugging you, right? They keep barging in on your office. It's, it's inevitable. Again, I don't care how much mindfulness you do, like you're gonna get stressed to some degree when your kids barge in on you when you're working. But if you can stop and, and think about, okay, why do my kids keep barging in on me, right? Let's get to the root of the problem. And if you start to think creatively, you might actually find interesting solutions to changing your environment, to changing the stressors in your environment. Now, your home, it's quarantine, like you can't, you can't make your kids go away so you can have a nice quiet office. But here's what you could do, for instance. You, if they really want your attention, right, you could try and make extra time to give really deliberate one-on-one -on -one attention for your kids in a really purposeful way at other times throughout the day. And I guarantee it, if you give them more of that kind of quality one-on-one -on -one attention, they will, they'll need it less at inopportune times, right? And you might decrease the frequency of them barging in. So if you can manage your stressors creatively, often you don't need to even do stress management in the first place. And I think a lot of people just assume that like, well, my environment's my environment, I can't change it. I just have to, you know, think differently about it. Yes, sometimes you can't change your environment, but you would be surprised at how much you can actually modify your environment in subtle but important ways if you take the time to think about it and get a little creative with it. So I just, I, I see people skipping over that all the time and it's such a lost opportunity because often you, you really can make some changes to your, um, to your environment and the things that happen to you, even if it seems like you can't. So I would just encourage people to not write that off and really um, consider that a little bit more. That would be kind of my second point on that. Yeah. It's kind of like addressing the symptoms, but not dealing with the disease. Yeah. It, that's a perfect metaphor. You know, like I love Band-Aids. I'm really glad there are Band-Aids and bandages, <laughs> right? But but it, but if I've got, if I've got a compound fracture, I don't care if it, like stopping the bleeding is great, but like I got to set the bone. At some point, you got to set the bone, right? Um, so it's but it, that's harder. It takes more thought. It takes more expertise. It takes more creativity. But I think you're really doing yourself a disservice if you are exclusively focused on treating the symptoms without considering the source or the the underlying kind of mechanism. Yes, uh, we have a question. Uh, and, and also last year during my journey across the country, a question that also kept popping up is that why is it that we don't uh, train and educate our school children and our college students uh, the healthy habit of dealing with a uh, stressful situation, uh, unexpected challenges, uh, you know? So why is it that we don't teach that, you know, we, we teach everything else, but we don't teach them how to create healthy emotional habits of, of how to deal with those stressful environments and situ situations. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it, it it's a hard question. I think there's there's a lot. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because this is my sort of my mission. I mean, I work with people clinically in my practice, but the reason I write and do stuff like this online is because th there's a lot of, there's a lot of just sort of basic information and habits we could all be learning that would if a lot of people learn some of this stuff that they, they wouldn't show up in my office nearly as much, like they, they wouldn't even need this like second layer of service. So I completely agree that we, we should in a perfect world, we should be teaching this at a younger age. Um, but there are some very real obstacles to this. Like for one thing, I think just structurally, if you think about time, if you think about money, it's very hard. If you, if I went into a school and said, you should start, you should, kids should have an hour a day where they learn about mental health. Cause it's at least as important as, you know, literature or chemistry. Well, may, maybe it is, but you're going to get a lot of pushback if you say like, well, okay, if you want to add an extra hour, you got to drop some other hour. So what are you going to, you going to drop chemistry? 
there's gonna be a lot of chemistry people who are gonna be uh, pretty upset with that. You know, drop PE, there's gonna be a lot of people. So there, there are, I think, real structural challenges to doing that. Um, the, the other thing is, I don't think we, as a field, as a mental health field, we're actually not very good at this. <laughs> so we are a very interventionist kind of disease focused field. Like we, we love classifying and categor categorizing disorders and diseases and, and, and helping people who are already quite distressed. And, and that's what we're good at. And so that's what we tend to look for. What we don't think about is prevention. I mean, that there is like, I mean, at least in, in physical medicine, the idea of preventative medicine is, is more of a thing and people have been talking about it for a while. Nobody talks about preventative medicine in mental health. So I, there just aren't enough people, uh, in my opinion, in my profession who are thinking this way, who are thinking, no, 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 no. I would rather not have to treat you for anxiety. And instead, when you're young, treat you, t teach you what anxiety is and how it works and what the effective habits are to minimize anxiety so that you never need to be treated for it in the first place. That's, it's just not, it's just not, we're just not trained to think like that. Mental health professionals just aren't, unfortunately. It's very sad, I think. Um, but I think it's gonna take kind of a new generation of thinkers in mental health who, who really value that idea and, and take it seriously. So that, that would be my other, um, yeah, big obstacle, I think, to why we don't do that. Yeah. You know, why do you think, Nick, that uh, the use of alcohol has increased? I recently read an article talking about a 400% increase in the amount of alcohol that's been delivered to homes through some uh, a new delivery type of service and, or purchasing alcohol. Why do you think people are really um, resorting to alcohol or drugs uh, to, to try to deal with the uh, current environment that we're in? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's another big question. I think there's, and yeah, how, there's probably a, a lot. That, yeah. How we can stop. Yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of factors that go into it, but I would imagine this is based on my talking with my own clients who actually have ad admitted that, that yeah, I'm drinking more than usual for sure. I think a big part of it goes back to this initial distinction I made between genuine resilience and coping. And I think a lot of us rely on after the fact coping strategies to feel better, to deal with stressors mm -hmm. or difficult things, right? It's, I feel bad and then I do something to try and not feel so bad. As opposed to what can I do while I'm feeling good to prevent feeling bad in the first place, right? So we all have this, it's a culture of coping, which is I'm, you know, I'm healthy until I'm sick, until I feel sick or I look sick, right? Which is any, uh, you know, general practitioner doctor will tell you is that is, you know, not a good way to approach health. You know, you want to use when you're healthy, you want to buffer your, your, your health so that you don't end up getting as sick in the first place. So I think what happens is a lot of people have, you know, before the pandemic, people had all sorts of coping skills for stress. If you were got really stressed at work, you would stop and have some drinks with coworkers before you go home. Right. Or, or you would, or you'd go to the gym, you know, you'd stop by the gym on the way home. It can be something relatively healthy like that. Right. But one of the things that happened with the virus and with the coronavirus and the lockdown in particular is people had their coping mechanisms decimated. All of a sudden, the vast majority of our coping skills and coping mechanisms just weren't available anymore. And so we just resort back to whatever ones are available, right? And so if maybe maybe exercise, maybe your, your kind of group yoga or jazzercise class was like your big coping mechanism for stress. Well, if, if your only other coping mechanism is alcohol, you lose the one, you're just going to go to the other one you have left. Um, so it's, it's, it's not very healthy, but if you don't have alternative sources of how do I feel good, you, you're going to, you're going to rely on those. Um, so I think that's the date to me, that's the danger of relying on coping mechanisms as opposed to trying to make resilient, the habit of resilience, a regular lifestyle practice. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. In, ter in terms of uh, uh, identifying your emotions and engaging them, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe finding an alternative ones, or you know the 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 process of being able to do that, 
it's a process that requires training, that requires more, you know, thinking through and slowing down. What is the best recommendation that you have for all of us who may may not have a psychologist or psychiatrist to see and, and have talk therapy to really try to be able to uh, think through our emotions and, yeah. and, 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 and really gauge them and say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. This is not, you know, what I right. should be, you know, overwhelmed by. And, and uh, w- what is the best approach? other than slowing down and, 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 and maybe taking a deep breath, but what else we can do? Yeah, so I'll give you a, I'll give you a high level philosophical answer and then a practical down to dirty answer. Okay. <laughs> the, high, the high level answer is it's absolute, the, the big, I almost, I go so far as to call this the original sin of mental health struggles. And it, it's this mistake we all tend to make because we, we've been acculturated to it, that we assume that when something feels bad, it is bad. So I'll say that again, if something feels bad, it is bad. And so we, if you think about, think about any form of pain, like if you put your hand on a hot stove by accident, right? You're going to feel awful. Here, here's the, here's the trick question is, is feeling bad the problem? Is pain dangerous? No, pain is a messenger. Pa- pain is a signal. It's information. The tissue damage is the problem. Right. That's what's really dangerous, that your your the tissue on your fingers is burning. Pain is just the messenger telling you, hey, do something. Something's wrong. You should probably do something. It's the same for emotion. It's this, it works the same way with emotions. When you're feeling emotional pain, the emotion itself isn't the problem. It's it's the messenger. It's your, right or wrong. Your brain is telling you, hey, we think something is wrong. You should like look at this more or do something differently. So you you absolutely, you, it, it takes a real mindset shift to if you want to understand your emotions better and be able to react to them in a more healthy way, you have to understand that emotions, painful emotions like anxiety or sadness or anger, they are not diseases. They're not viruses. They're, they're not some foreign invader in your body that you need to get rid of. They are, they are de- evolution designed them over hundreds of thousands of years for a purpose. They, they're your body working properly. Okay, so it's fundamental that you have a different, uh, a more accurate re- um, take on what your emotions are, even the painful ones. And that is there. It's just your body trying to help. It's just your body sending you a signal that like, hey, something's wrong. You got a lot of stress in your life or there's this thing that could be dangerous coming up or you made this mistake and like, gosh, we really don't want to make that again. Right. And the pain is your mind's way of saying this is really important do something about this, <laughs> but the pain is not the problem. So I think that's really important. So that's why cultivating a curious attitude toward your emotions and not giving in to the combative fight or flee approach to emotions is so, so important. So that's that's the big kind of philosophical answer. Here's something really practical you can do. I mentioned mindfulness. So starting a mindfulness practice is, is wonderful. I really recommend it. Um, But here's an even simpler thing everyone can do, I think, to better understand and process your own emotions. And that is journaling. Now, I don't, people have different associations with journaling. All all I mean when I say journaling is you take a little bit of time each day, maybe it's five, 10 minutes, and you simply, you just write whatever's in your head, whatever's going through your mind, whatever sort of thoughts, feelings, emotions, whatever are, are going on. You just write about them. You say, man, it's really hard day at work, you know, so and so said this, you know, and I got really defensive. And then I got kind of angry, and I lashed out. And I could tell, you know, so and so was, you know, kind of looked down on me for doing that. And I wish I hadn't done that. But I, at the time, I didn't really know what to, it's like stream of consciousness, you're just writing down your thoughts. And what happens is when you do this, it, it literally gives you perspective on your thoughts. And when you have perspective on your thoughts and on your emotions, you, you, have, you, you will tend to have new insights on them. You, you will recognize, you'll see them in a new light. This is exactly what happens in therapy. Like when you go and talk to a therapist, they're not taking in your problems and then, and then like put, punching them through like some kind of analysis machine and then saying, here, go do this, right? That doesn't work. People giving you advice rarely works. The way therapy works is you come to insights and realizations yourself as a result of externalizing things and talking them through. 
by getting perspective on them, it, it allows you to think about them in a different way and therefore handle them differently. So that's why I think journaling, just literally just writing, you can do it whatever form you want. All that matters is you're writing about how you're feeling and what you're thinking. Um, could be in the moment, could be about what happened before, could be about something you're worried about. Um, but that's a really practical way, I think. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Awesome. And I do have another question. Uh, uh, where do you think exercise fits in resilience? Physical exercise. Yeah, I, I think it's it's, it's it's a biased I, question coming from me. <laughs> well, it is, but it's it's a fascinating question because there is plenty of evidence that suggests, like for for all but the most severe forms of depression, for instance, getting on a regular program of exercise is just as effective as either um, antidepressant medication or talk therapy which is wild. Like if you think about it, that, that is amazing <laughs> that exercising more can be just as beneficial as what we professionals do, you know, just a simple act of exercising regularly. And the same is true. Like we, you get similar effects with anxiety and with almost every other emotional struggle I'm aware of. So it is, it is undoubtedly one of the best things you can do for just your emotional well being in particular, but, but for resilience too, when people are, when people come into my office and they're like, oh, it's just been an awful couple of weeks, X, Y, and Z happened. And, and I, I will literally go back with them and I'll say, okay, um, tell me about your, like your regular habits. Like how's your sleep been? How's your diet been? How's your exercise been? W without fail, you will see those things start to trail off before or during their struggles with emotion, like started spiking. Yeah. So it, it's, it's so ironic that when we start to struggle emotionally, the first things we give up are the very things we need most, which is like, you know, you're, you're all this, all this stuff I'm talking about journaling, thinking more flexibly about your emotions. Like none of that's going to work very well. If you're, if you're not taking care of your body, right. That is your, your, your brain is not separate from your body. It is, it is your body. It is in your body. It relies on your body. And so if you're not taking care of those foundational things like diet, sleep and exercise, it's, you know, you're, you're done for, <laughs> you know, I mean, not really, but you're really, you're really at a disadvantage. So, and I think exercise is one of the, the simpler ones that anyone can, almost anyone can start going for walks around the block after dinner. You know, almost anyone can start um, doing some pushups in their office. You know, it's, so I, I'm, you know, I'll get off my soapbox, <laughs> that'll, but I, I think it's huge. I just think it's so important. Awesome. Uh, I have a question about how uh, how can we learn more about your approach and where can we go to to find out about it for resilience trainer? Sure. So I um, like I said, I do a lot of writing online and, and sort of my my home is my, my website. It's just my name, nickwignall.com. Um, and I, I have a email newsletter that I send out every Monday where I, I write new articles every week, usually um, a couple articles. And I have a podcast and so I release new episodes where I interview other experts in psychology and mental health. And so my um, if you want to go sign up for my newsletter, that's a great place um, to just keep in touch with what I do and get a sense for the, the type of stuff I write about and, and um, talk about and try and work with people on. So that's awesome. Thank you. And one other question about really, and we've had a number of uh, actually questions about that, Nick, is really dealing with children. And uh, and, and appears to be um, a, really a, uh, a, a concern that in the last three sessions that we had, there was a lot of questions about kids and the challenges with the young individuals, uh, especially uh, with the, all the constraints in the current in the current events that we're in. So any, any practical recommendations to parents or children? Yeah, I, you know, I would actually say, and I, I don't want this to sound, um, well, speaking of resilience, kids are resilient. Kid, I, I think kids are much more resilient than we give them credit for. And this is something that I struggle a lot with the parent because I'm, I want to be a really good parent and I'm, I'm, I'm involved and I, I really try and help my kids a lot and I want them to grow and I want them to be healthy and, and strong and, but, you know, it's not all on us. It's important to be a conscientious parent and to be involved, but kid, kids can do a lot and learn a lot on their own. Like they, to a large extent, 
they like they will be okay. They will learn, and, and even to some extent, difficulties, changes to routine, you know, major kind of upheavals. In some ways, I think it's it's really an opportunity. I mean, it, it's very difficult. And I, I know, like I've got a bunch of little kids myself. It's very frustrating. It's very challenging. There's a lot of worry and concern about how my kids, how are they doing? Like I'm always frustrated with them because I'm working and I'm I'm trying to homeschool them and, I, and I'm trying to put dinner on the table and I'm constantly like snippy and all this kind of stuff. And I would just say like, take it easy on yourself. Like your kids will be okay just because you're more impatient with them or just because they're not going to all their play dates that they normally go to or, or even if they're missing chunks of school, like it, by and large, like I, they will they will be okay. And I think if you are adding the extra burden of this extra layer of stress onto yourself about my kids aren't having the perfect experience and I'm not being a good parent, you're you're actually making it harder on yourself to be um, available and helpful to them. So have some self-compassion and have a little trust that like kids are, they're resilient. And I think by and large, they will be okay. Um, that, I guess that would be my, my final thought. Awesome, awesome. And I think one last question that we have time for is has to do with ethnicity and whether or not you, you know, there are more challenges in some ethnic groups in, in, in addressing mental health issues or, or accepting it as, as a real challenge. And uh, what is your experience with you is and what suggestion that you may have? Well, it's definitely my experience that that's true, that there are certainly challenges on all sorts of levels for, you know, all sorts of minorities, broadly speaking, whether it's ethnic or socioeconomic or racial or, or whatever it might be um, in terms of all sorts of things, in terms of access, you know, in, in our profession, like it's it's very hard to get high quality mental health care. If you, if you frankly, if you don't have a lot of money, um, it's, it's just really tough. Um, so that that's a big thing. You, you see it in terms of um, sort of cultural attitudes towards mental health. A, a lot of cultures have, um, like I know, I, I know here in, in New Mexico, there's a in the there's a kind of a what's called the machismo culture, which is this kind of tough guy. Like when you're struggling, you just sort of like grit and bear it kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if that's how you've been raised, if you've been raised with that value system in mind, it's going to make it very difficult to call up a therapist and say, Hey, I'm really struggling and, and I need help. Like, that's just, that's very hard for, for people of different backgrounds and, and cultures. And so I think, yeah, I just think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of trouble there. My, my I guess my, I, it's not a solution by any means, but what I always encourage people when it comes to mental health is just to be very curious and experimental with it. So I get asked all the time, like, how do I find a good therapist? Or I'm really struggling with depression. How do I, what can I do to start working on it? But what I always tell people is like, you know, just because you call up a therapist doesn't mean you're not signing on to doing weekly therapy for the rest of your life. You can just call someone up and talk with them and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing therapy or I'm thinking about getting some counseling. I'm struggling with, you know, anxiety about this or that. Um, how, what would therapy like with you be like? What, what, what would it be like? Like, how often would we meet? Um, how do you like to work? What are some of the things we would talk about? You can just, exp it's like, it's like buying a car, right? You, you wouldn't just show up on the, on, on the lot and drive off in the first thing you see. You go for some test drives, you, you do some research online, you, you, you just kind of poke around and you experiment, right? And so if, I, I think a lot of people have the, uh, uh, kind of resistance to mental health. Um, and I, I would say, if you can try and, and, and it's partly our fault as a profession is we make it this big, mysterious kind of quasi mystical thing. A lot of times we make it far more complicated than it needs to be. Um, and that's, that's nonsense. Like it's, it's, it's not mystical or, or magical or special um, in a lot of ways. It's in fact, it's very ordinary um, in, in a lot of important ways. And so you, you can, in some ways you can approach it just like if you were hiring a mechanic or buying a car or, or you know, or, I don't know, going grocery shopping. Like, I, I think having an attitude like that can actually be really helpful. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's, hopefully that is something. It's, well, it's a big problem. It, I mean, it, it is a big issue. It yeah. is a big issue. Well, uh, Nick, uh, that's all the time that we have. So thank you so much. This has been incredible, very helpful. And I thank you, all of you who have joined us uh, on this, on this uh, webinar. 
And like I mentioned, may have mentioned earlier that this will be available for those of you who signed up uh, sh uh, within an hour after this webinar is over. And the entire webinars will be available uh, by the early part of next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wignell. And you all have a you wonderful day. Thank you. Take care.